A History of the Yoruba People S. Adabanji Akindi The Yoruba Diaspora The Atlantic slave trade was not the first agency that established elements of the Yoruba as settlers beyond the homeland. As earlier pointed out, trade had, before then, resulted in Yoruba settler colonies in many distant places on the African continent. Before, and during, the centuries of the Atlantic slave trade, colonies of Yoruba traders lived in Noop, Hausa and Kanuri towns in the north, in Benin in the southeast, in probably every sizable Asia town in the west, and probably in as far away places as the Valley of the Senegal in the west and the Valley of the Congo in the east. To these must be added those Yoruba who ended up as slaves in Dahomey in the 19th century. Together, all these amounted to a very sizable Yoruba diaspora unrelated to the transatlantic slave trade. Moreover, there are fairly clear indications of the impact of Yoruba culture in at least some of these distant lands for instance, the impact of Yoruba political culture and language among the Edo and the Asia, the widespread influence of Yoruba trading practices, and the influence of Yoruba religion among various peoples in West Africa. What the Atlantic slave trade did was to lengthen the reach of the Yoruba diaspora beyond Africa to the Americas, as well as to Sierra Leone and to create extracted and mixed African communities within which the Yoruba culture came to offer very significant cultural contributions. Yoruba people were latecomers to the enforced transplantation of Africans as slaves across the Atlantic Ocean to the Americas. The Atlantic slave trade started in the 16th century, but hardly any Yoruba were recorded in the trade until the 17th century, and these were very few. From about 1750, starting with the beginning of the Troubles in the Oyo Empire, the number of Yoruba slaves on the slave ships began to increase. It then increased rapidly as the 19th century opened, reaching a peak in about 1826, and remaining more or less at that peak until 1850. From about 1850, the number declined and continued to dwindle until about 1867 when the transatlantic shipment of Africans as slaves finally ceased. The total number of Yoruba taken to the Americas as slaves, from the first in about the late 16th century to the last ones in about 1867 has been estimated to be about 1.12 million, representing a little less than 9% of all Africans taken to the Americas as slaves during the three centuries of the trade. Of this number, nearly 80% were taken away in the century between 1750 and 1850. Yoruba slaves were taken to most regions of the Americas from the area of Chesapeake Bay in North America to that of Rio de la Plata in South America, as well as to many of the islands of the West Indies. Various sizes of Yoruba slave groups emerged in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia and Florida in North America, some of the countries of Central America Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Panama, and others, Guyana, Suriname, Venezuela and Brazil in South America, and Cuba, St. Domingue, Haiti, Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobago, Barbados, Guadeloupe, Martinique, St. Lucia, etc. in the West Indies. In only three of these destinations namely, St. Domingue, the large island of Cuba, and the province of Bahia in Brazil did Yoruba slaves constitute sizable percentages of the total numbers of African slaves. Estimates of Yoruba arrivals in these three destinations vary. According to recent estimates, a total of 700,000 African slaves were received into St. Domingue, of whom about 173,000 originated from ports on the Bight of Benin, that is, the coasts of modern western Nigeria and of the republics of Benin and Togo. Of the 173,000, about 25% to 30% or 43,00057,000 were Yoruba. An estimated total of about 564,000 African slaves were taken to Cuba, about 85% of them during the 19th century alone. Since for some years of the 19th century, the Yoruba constituted the largest single ethnic group being exported from the coasts of West Africa, slave imports into Cuba contained large numbers of persons of Yoruba origin. It is estimated that about 12% of Cuba's African slave imports were of Yoruba origin that is, roughly 68,000. The Portuguese colonies in South America, which by 1822 became together the independent country of Brazil, were the destination of some 3.5 million African slaves, imported from about 1550 to about 1850 to various parts of the country. Of these, about 25%, that is, about 850,000, originated from West African ports the rest from West Central Africa, the area of the Congo and Angola. The coast of West Africa was known among Portuguese slave traders as Mina Coast, and therefore, all slaves coming from West Africa were called the Mina in most parts of Brazil. It was not until the last quarter of the 18th century that Yoruba slaves began to be significant in Brazilian slave imports. From 1800 to 1850, 
the total number of Yoruba arriving in various provinces of Brazil rose much higher than before, and from then on the group name Mina came to be applied specifically to the Yoruba slaves in most parts of Brazil except in the province of Bahia where they were called Nago. The name Nago is believed to be derived from Anago, a common name by which Yoruba people were known among Dahomey and other Asia people, from among whom many slaves came to the Americas in general, and to Brazil, long before the arrival of the earliest Yoruba slaves. In spite of the considerable increase in Yoruba arrivals, Yoruba slaves continue to be minorities among African slaves in most parts of the country with the exception of the province of Bahia. In the province of Bahia, the Yoruba became the largest group of arriving slaves from about 1800, because Bahian slave carriers came to concentrate much of their traffic on the ports of the Yoruba coast. It has been estimated that a total of 439,000 Yoruba slaves were taken to Bahia from about 1675 to about 1850 and that about 292,000 of these were taken there during the 50 years 18,001,850. The total Yoruba imports of 439,000 represented about 40% of all African slaves received by Bahia throughout the era of the Atlantic slave trade. In no other area of the Americas did the Yoruba as a group have the level of numerical strength in the African slave community, and freed African community, that they had in the above three destinations. But, as will be seen below, even though they were numerically small in most places, their cultural influence and impact was considerable almost everywhere they were taken. In all destinations to which the African slaves were taken in the Americas, their lives came to exhibit certain common features. First, they were imported and purchased to supply labor on plantations, of sugar cane, tobacco, cotton, etc., in other agricultural pursuits, in processing enterprises, like sugar processing, in the mines, in the ports, in various trades, in commerce, as carriers of goods, and as domestic hands for their masters. Their lives as slaves were tied to these enterprises and to activities ancillary to such, and their quality of life, in shelter, food and other provisions, depended on the particular conditions of their servitude. Secondly, even if any African slaves were shipped to the Americas in boats containing mostly or even only slaves from their own ethnic group or nationality, they invariably were thrown together, in the Americas with slaves from other African ethnic and cultural groups. Each slave community was thus confronted with the challenge of forging and inventing new bonds of association and identity, drawing on the realities of their situation but, as most studies of the African diaspora would now confirm, every such creating, inventing and forging was informed by the African cultural heritages that the slaves had brought with them. Thus were produced the many variations of African American cultures, or Creole cultures, now existing as very significant contributions to the civilizations of the New World. Of the contributions of the cultural heritage of the Yoruba people to these processes, a fair amount is known today. And the overall assessment seems to be that the cultural impact of the Yoruba people on the evolution of African American or Creole cultures was great greater than the numbers of the Yoruba slaves could justify. In a recent study, David Eltis writes, Within coerced African migration, the Yoruba were among the latest to arrive but were neither the most numerous nor the least scattered over the Americas. Reasonably precise estimates for other groups will eventually become available, but it is probable that Igbo and some West Central African peoples were larger and more heavily concentrated than the Yoruba the Igbo in parts of the British Caribbean and some of what have been termed Congo groups in Southeast Brazil. Yet the impact of the Yoruba speakers on Creole societies that emerged in many parts of the Americas appears to modern scholars to have been strong and, in the light of the evidence presented here, out of proportion to the relative size of Yoruba arrivals. In comparison, that is, with other African groups, they contributed considerably more to Creole or African American civilization in oral traditions, especially as expressed in songs, religious rituals, stories, proverbs, and so on as well as in various modes of family and societal structures. The main explanation for this is to be found in the strength of the civilization from which the Yoruba of the New World were extracted and taken away into slavery its strong family and settlement traditions, its urban orientation, its social and associational traditions, its innumerable cooperative, collaborative and support institutions, its highly developed artistic culture as expressed in the visual arts and folklore, and its strong religion. The view of the Yoruba voiced by Louis Antoine Amy de Vertoy in 1858 is similar to views expressed by many other foreign observers in that century. He wrote that they were, guided in marked degree by the sense of association, the principle of combination for the common wheel has been fully sustained wherever they have settled in any numbers, in fact the whole Yoruba race may be said to form a sort of social league for mutual support and protection.
An additional explanation was the widespread cultural influence which the Yoruba established over much of West Africa before and during the centuries of the slave trade. To the east and west of Yorubland, Yoruba traditions and myths of origin, and Yoruba ideas of the importance of Ife, early influenced the Edo and Asia. As states and trade grew in these places, the Yoruba language, as would be remembered, developed into a sort of common language, especially for commercial purposes no doubt a product of the widespread impact of Yoruba trade. The expansion of Yoruba cultural influence reached its climax in the era of the greatness of the Oyo Empire, Oyo being, not only an empire builder and trader, but a mighty carrier of Yoruba culture far and wide. Founded and led by a mixture of Yoruba and Asia elements, the Kingdom of Dahomey minutely mirrored Yoruba cultural institutions and traditions, all of which were later reinforced by Oyo conquest and overlordship. In particular through the Dahomey and other Asia people taken as slaves across the Atlantic, the influence of Yoruba culture was already significant in a number of places, for instance, St. Domingue, Haiti, long before the arrival of Yoruba slaves, and considerably assisted the growth of Yoruba cultural influence after that point. The Nagos of Bahia Bahia province was one of the richest sugar plantation areas of Brazil, beginning from the 16th century. Most of its sugar plantations were established in the area of soft marshy soil known as Recon Cabo lying east of Salvador, the capital city of Bahia. Bahia was also important for another cash crop tobacco. Manioc, or cassava, grown extensively in the province, was the main food for the masses of slaves, freed persons and the poor. Practically every one of the many African ethnic groups of Bahia organized for itself some sort of collective association or parenti, the Portuguese word for relative, but the available evidence indicates that the Nago group was the most cohesive, strongest and most influential. Nago Parat groups existed on the plantations, in the remote villages, as well as in the city of Salvador. Many factors contributed to the building of the Nago identity. Of these, the foremost, of course, was the common Yoruba language. Then there were the common religion, Yoruba facial marks, surviving Yoruba personal names, belief in common descent from Oduduwa, and belief in Ife as a common, sacred, ancestral home. Religion gave the whole package a very powerful binder. On the whole, local and lineage deities and spirits common back home in Yoruba land tended to fade away in the slave community in Bahia, giving way and prominence to the pan-Yoruba gods like the supreme deity Alarun, ruler of heaven, Obatala, Ogun, Sango. Ifa, Olokun, Yamoja, etc. The worship of these Orzes of Yoruba civilization became known in Bahia as Kondomble. Inevitably, other non Yoruba elements in the general African society of Bahia contributed some features to Kondomble, but, essentially, in its ultimate form, Kondomble was Yoruba and a significant gift to the civilization of Bahia and Brazil. Rituals, festivals, and the forms of art in the worship of the Yoruba gods have continued vibrantly in Brazil spreading beyond Bahia to Rio de Janeiro and other parts of the country. In fact, in more recent times, descendants of non-Yoruba African peoples of Brazil have increasingly embraced condomblé and Yoruba forms of art as a means of asserting an African heritage and identity. Even significant parts of the white Brazilian population have become attracted into the culture represented by condomblé. In 19th century Bahia, Condomblé served to reinforce Yoruba ethnic identity by bringing adherents together frequently in rituals, divinations, sacrifices, feasts and festivals, usually including loud music with drums as well as dancing. At the beginning, some of the Nagos were excluded from Condomblé because of their adherence to other religions, especially to Islam and to Roman Catholicism, the religion of the Portuguese slave masters. Some of the Yoruba taken as slaves to Bahia were Muslims, while interaction with the Portuguese resulted in the emergence of some Nago Roman Catholic converts and brotherhoods. Over time, however, the exclusion of the Nago Muslims and Roman Catholics was overcome in a uniquely Nago fashion. While in Yoruba religion the Orises are worshipped separately, each with his or her own shrine and rituals, Roman Catholicism's many saints are venerated in the same church building. The Nagos came to adopt for Condomblé this Roman Catholic practice so that all Yoruba gods and goddesses came to be worshipped under the same roof. This simplified Condomblé for all Nagos, it also resulted ultimately in the convergence, for the Nagos, of the idioms of Condomblé and Roman Catholicism. The Nagos thus invented a Yoruba Catholicism, making it possible for each individual Nago to belong to both the religious systems of the Orisaes and the Catholic saints to have patron saints and patron orzes, and to be free to choose to offer sacrifices to the orzes and the saints. As for Islam, the Yoruba Muslims in Bahia had formed themselves into local groups early in the century and their leaders had in fact taken over the leadership of Islam in Bahia from other Muslim peoples like the Hausa, 
During the second half of the century, however, the Muslim groups and Islam in general declined, so that, gradually, virtually all Nagos flowed into the general spiritual spectrum of Condomble. Within Condomble, therefore, Nago ethnic identity and solidarity became strongly expressed in spiritual and ritualistic terms. In terms of work and the workplace, there were many differences between the Nagos who lived and worked on the plantations and the rural villages and those who lived and worked in the city of Salvador. For both, however, Candombal's rituals and celebrations, as well as other expressions and institutions of Nago ethnic solidarity, were very important pillars of life. They did not only knit together Nagos of particular plantations and villages, they created links between Nago groups in distant plantations and villages, and between these and the Nagos of the city. Official records of various localities of Bahia contain accounts of Nago celebrations in villages and plantations, some of them at the workplace, and some bringing together large numbers of Nagos from many villages and plantations, especially on public holidays. In the city, Nagos worked either as domestic hands or in the streets. Some of those who worked in the streets worked as cooks, tailors, seamstresses, washerwomen, bricklayers, carpenters, porters, traders, etc. of the men. Some worked in the ports, loading and unloading ships and carrying heavy loads of cargo for delivery to merchants' warehouses or to homes. Some of the men also worked as sedan chair carriers to convey rich clients through the streets. For the women who sold cooked food in the streets, and for men and women who sold other goods, life was very similar to life in typical Yoruba towns where, in addition to the mass trading in the marketplaces, petty traders went from street to street offering things for sale. Slaves usually lived in quarters provided by their masters but they were free to go out and work in the streets. In very few cases, masters allowed their slaves to live in houses rented by the slaves themselves. Among the Nago slaves working in the streets, a practice arose whereby workers in the same trades were organized into groups called kandos each of which was modeled after the Yoruba farming institutions of Aro within which, as would be remembered, members collaborated to give voluntary services to one another on their farms. Other ethnic groups among the slaves had kandos also, organized along lines of their own cultures. Each Nago Kanto appointed one of its members as its captain, whose function it was to work out the details of job contracts with clients, to allocate tasks in the job, to receive payment from clients and distribute it to members. Within each Kanto, members usually rendered small, uniquely Yoruba, services to one another, the Ifa diviner performed divinations for the rest, the herbalist or healer prescribed herbal preparations and treatments. Almost all the above work by slaves in the streets was governed by a system called ganho or hire out. Under the system, a slave entered into an agreement with his master to go and work in the streets and bring home to the master daily or weekly a given sum of money, and keep the rest of his earnings to himself. The city slave could thus have some independent income, and if he was hardworking and prudent in handling his money, he could build up some savings. In the plantations and villages, a slave was usually allowed to raise a small garden where he grew manioc and vegetables, part of the harvest of which he could sell in the slave community. Usually he would process the manioc into flour for sale. Like the city slave, the village or plantation slave could thus build up some savings. The most important thing that a slave usually used his savings for was to buy his freedom. It was part of the Bahyad system that a slave could offer money to his master as payment for freedom. Many masters would accept such payment and set their slaves free. However, a master was not obliged to do so. He could refuse but a master's refusal in such a situation usually led to troubles between the master and his slave. Quite often, it resulted in slaves running away to secure their freedom usually a very risky step, since fugitive slaves were usually likely to be recaptured and severely punished. In 1871, a law was made to correct this situation, the law laid it down that if a slave offered a fair price for his freedom, his master must accept and set him free. In some cases, masters chose on their own to set free, without any payment slaves who had very good records of service. The way that this mostly happened was that an old slave master would include in his will a grant of freedom to the favored slave. From as early as the first decade of the 19th century, therefore, there were some freed men and women in the Nago community. In most cases, freed persons simply continued to work the same trades as they had been doing before their manumission, and remained as members of the cantos to which they had belonged. Some of the most enterprising established fairly successful trading businesses, became fairly rich and came to own slaves. Mostly, they would take merchandise from the city for sale to rural communities, and bring from the rural areas livestock like chickens and pigs as well as farm produce and manioc flour for sale in the city. Some even became international traders, traveling as passengers on the slave ships and buying goods, especially homespun Yoruba cloth. 
on the West African coast for sale in the Nago community in Bahia. Candombal's rituals and celebrations, and various other Nago networks, served as powerful agencies of mutual help and support. For instance, the Nago slave struggling to obtain his freedom, while slowly saving money for the purpose, also had some support to lean on in the Nago community help through manumission societies known as Junas de Alfornia. These were credit organizations which provided funds, in the form of rotational loans, to assist individuals to buy their freedom a sort of Nago version of the Yoruba system of Isisu. The individual would borrow money from the group to supplement his personal savings, and buy freedom for himself. When he became free, he would pay the loan back in installments into the fund. For the Nago slave who was compelled by circumstances to choose to run away from his master, help was usually available also, not only from close family and friends, but, more importantly, from the extended Nago networks especially if other members of the Nago community were convinced that running away was, in the particular case, justified. Moreover, more substantial forms of resistance to slavery, such as large-scale revolts, were quite common among the Nagos. In fact, the Nagos revolted more frequently, and exhibited much better organization in revolt, than any other African group in Bahia proof of their more sophisticated networking. In other provinces of Brazil, the Nagos of Bahia became widely known for their revolts, and yet, on the whole, the slavery system and the conditions of the Nagos in Bahia do not appear to have been any more oppressive than one would find among other African slaves in Bahia or in any other part of Brazil. The frequent and massive revolts by the Nagos were therefore apparently a function of their native culture. The typical political life in a Yoruba kingdom and community tended, on the whole, to nurture confidence and a spirit of freedom, and it is significant that many of the young Yoruba men taken into slavery in the early 19th century had taken part in wars in their country, and therefore had come to Bahia with some military training, skills and experience. The first major Nago rebellion on record occurred in 1814 when large numbers of Nagos joined with other ethnic groups, mostly houses, in a wide-ranging armed action that attacked parts of the port areas and headed for the main plantation areas, before they were stopped and overcome by troops. Other similar revolts, in which the Nagos allied with other groups, followed. The 1820s witnessed more than 12 violent revolts in which the Nagos provided the leadership and most, or sometimes all, of the activists. Some of these resulted in the burning of sugarcane plantations and plantation headquarters. One in September 1827 burned ten plantations before it was suppressed. Between 1828 and 1830, the Bahian authorities set up a plan whereby military units were stationed in the plantations, thus protecting them against the Nago revolts. That, however, did not put an end to the revolts, it only shifted them into the city of Salvador itself. In April 1830, a major Nago revolt shook the city. Supplied early in the morning with swords and knives looted from some hardware warehouses, a large crowd of Nagos gathered. Newly imported Yoruba slaves were roused and asked to join, many did, and the few who refused to join were killed. The large army of rebels then attacked a garrison or police establishment, but they did not have the kinds of weapons that might have enabled them to overcome its defenders. As the fighting raged, more troops arrived, and the revolt was brutally put down. Five years later, in January 1835, the most serious revolt in Salvador followed. The Nago slaves put much careful planning into this revolt, assisted by some Nago freed men. Their intention was to strike on Sunday, January 25. Unfortunately for them, however, their plans leaked to the authorities. As they were putting finishing touches to their plans on the evening of Saturday, in the home of a Nago freed man, law enforcement authorities burst upon them. The plotters resisted arrest, and the fighting between them and their assailants spread to the streets, where large numbers of African slaves, overwhelmingly Nagos, responded to the call of the rebel leaders, and a massive crowd surged through the streets, shouting the battle cry, Viva Nago, meaning, long live the Nagos. Attacks on police stations, military barracks and other institutions of government followed. Unable to take any of these, because they did not have guns, they then made a bid to reach the region of the plantations, where Nago plantation slaves were waiting, according to arrangement, to join them. But before they could get far, the militia intercepted them. Fighting the well-armed troops as best as they could, the rebels were finally scattered and suppressed. The Nagos numbered only about 30% of the African population of Bahia in 1835, but their numerical participation in this large revolt of early 1835 has been estimated to have been in excess of 70%, and their share in the organized leadership of it was nearly 100%. In the trials that followed the revolt, almost all the dozens of the ringleaders found guilty and convicted were Nagos, three were houses. Of its foremost leaders, four, all Nagos, were executed.
Most of these revolts were led by city slaves, but the Nago networks made it easy for plantation and village slaves to be quickly involved. Some of the freed persons among the Nagos secretly or openly assisted the revolts. In some of the revolts, runaway slave communities known as Quilimbos, hidden in the woods, played significant roles. In such places Condomblé usually had a strong presence, and contributed much to the spirit and promotion of revolt. In the 1835 revolt, many of the Nago revolt planners were Muslims, but all of them did what they did as members of the Nago nation and not in the service of religion. By the time of the revolt, the Nagos had become dominant in Islamic leadership in Bahia. Following the suppression of the revolt, Islam and its influence declined among the Nagos as well as in Bahia in general. The 1835 revolt was the last major slave revolt in Bahia, but it did not mark the end of militant resistance by the Nagos to unjust constraints. Concerning the slave trade and slavery, the situation was changing in the world and general change is pointing to the end of both. The Nagos gradually changed with the changing prospects, focusing their acts of resistance on specific acts of oppression. When in 1836-7 the government decided to abolish the Kandos and substitute for them government-created workgroups, the Nagos, slaves and freed persons alike, resisted so emphatically that all work in the city nearly ground to a halt forcing the business owners to speak up in support of the Kandos, thus forcing the government to give up. This kind of confrontation resurfaced in the 1850s, when the municipal government of Salvador made a law in 1857 demanding that porters in the city be registered, pay an annual tax, and display identity badges on their persons. Led by the Nagos, who constituted a majority of porters, the porters went on strike for a whole week the first such strike in the history of Brazil paralyzing business in the city. Again, the business owners, whose businesses were threatened with destruction, brought pressure to bear on the government forcing it to give up the tax, though not the identity badges. The end finally came to the slave trade in Bahia and all of Brazil and ultimately to slavery also. The slave trade was abolished in Brazil in 1850, causing any further importation of slaves to Bahia to cease. From the 1860s slavery became the hottest issue in Brazilian politics. Powerful interests resisted the abolition of slavery, even as all other countries in the Americas abolished it. Finally, however, Slavery was abolished in Brazil too in 1888. The Lucumis of Cuba It is probable that some of the earliest few Yoruba people to be involved in the Atlantic slave trade were taken by Spanish traders to Cuba and St. Domingue in the 16th century. Cuban records of the 1570s mention some Lucumi slaves. As in other places in the Americas, however, it was not until the late 18th century that the Yoruba began to appear in considerable numbers among slaves arriving in Cuba. Then, from the beginning of the 19th century, with the wars going on in Yoruba land, and with Cuba needing many slaves for its expanding sugarcane plantations, the number of Yoruba arriving in Cuba rose very sharply. As earlier pointed out, these increases raised the total number of Yoruba slaves imported to Cuba throughout the centuries of the slave trade to about 12% of all African slaves imported to the island. This means that, even in spite of the high numbers of Yoruba arrivals in the early 19th century, Persons of Yoruba descent were always a small minority among persons of African descent in Cuba. Yoruba slaves, and also, later, Yoruba freed persons, were called Lukumis in Cuba and in many other places in the Americas. In Cuba, however, that name appears to have been more intensively and more persistently used. Concerning the origin of the name, there has been considerable debate among scholars. We may discard the suggestion that it came from the name of a Yoruba kingdom called El Komi or El Kami because we know that no Yoruba kingdom ever bore such a name, even though Alfred Dapper mentioned a kingdom of Alkami in 1668. There has been speculation that it might have arisen from the Yoruba phrase, Olakumi, my friend, with which Yoruba slaves probably identified and greeted one another in the strange and oppressive environment of New World slavery. Whatever its origin, the name Lukumi stuck to Yoruba people in most parts of the New World, and it has been most often employed for the Yoruba people of Cuba. In the earliest years of their presence in Cuba in the late 16th and early 17th century, the Yoruba slaves seem to have been identified by the appending of the names of their subgroups thus, Lukumi Yabu, Ijebu, Lukumi Uba, Igba, Lukumi Ayo, Oyo, etc. From the beginning of slavery in Cuba, the African slaves became organized into fraternities known as Cabildos de Nacion, each of which brought together Africans of the same ethnic origin. Approved of, and encouraged by, the Spanish rulers of the island, each Cabildo de Nacion served as a forum within which Africans of the same ethnic group interacted together to practice and preserve their cultural heritage, their language, their native rituals, art, music, dance, chants, folklore, etc. Later, when, through manumission, 
a number of Africans became freed persons, they joined the cabildos de mission of their respective ethnic groups in all parts of the country. In general, these associations became very powerful instruments of mutual help and support in the social and economic lives of their members, providing various kinds of assistance, contact, and recreation. Typically, each was led by a capital, king or captain, and a matrona, queen, who not only provided leadership in the internal affairs of their association, but also managed its relationships with the colonial and local authorities. For the Lukumis in Cuba, the Cabildos de Nacion proved an invaluable organization within which they developed a Yoruba-Cuban cultural heritage, based on Yoruba social, religious, ritualistic, musical, dance, artistic and aesthetic values, and drawing richly and meaningfully on the Spanish and inter-African heritages of the Cuban milieu. In the process, in spite of their comparative smallness in the overall African population of Cuba, in spite of their comparative lateness to come in sizable numbers to Cuba, and in spite of contributions by cultures of the Asia and the Congo, the Lukumis came to contribute, during the 19th century, more than any other African ethnic group to the development and definition of an Afro-Cuban identity and culture. In fact, for the Cabildos de Mission of the capital city, Havana, Yoruba cultural roots provided ultimately the major part of the African foundation upon which growth was attained in aesthetics, music, dance, rituals, literature, etc. In the course of the 1920s and 1930s, African identity and consciousness created, from the 19th century roots, the Afro-Cubanismo movement which strongly defined and highlighted African contributions to the cultural development of Cuba. According to Eltis, many aspects of Afro-Cuban culture may not be instantly recognizable to Yoruba people in West Africa, but it would be difficult to find many of its roots in non-Yoruba Africa. One of the most important gifts of the Lukumis to Afro-Cuban culture was the religion known as Santeria. Like the Bahian Condomble, Santeria received some inputs from various African cultural heritages in Cuba, but its African foundation and ultimate form were based on Yoruba religion and the Yoruba worship of the Orzes. Santeria was developed from a syncretization of the Yoruba worship of the Orzes with Roman Catholic practices. What resulted was neither an African nor Roman Catholic religion but a peculiar Cuban spiritual and ritual system mostly based on Yoruba religious and ritual systems. Santeria means both the way of the saints, that is, the saints of the Roman Catholic faith, and Laraglita Ocha, the rule of the Orzes. The central doctrine of Santeria is that every human being has a guiding and protector spirit that is, an Orisa or saint who is like a parent to the person, for which reason adherents of Santeria often say that they are sons or daughters of their guiding saints or Orzes. Each of the spiritual beings in this arrangement is associated with a force of nature and some aspect of human life, a central belief in Yoruba religion. For instance, Chongo, also known as Saint Barbara, is the Orisa or saint that controls lightning, thunder and fire, giver of power over difficulties, symbol of passion and strength. Yemaja, also known as the Virgin of Regla, is the Orisa or saint of the sea and symbol of motherhood. Tens of saints and Orisas were thus given attributes and symbolisms in this complex religious system. The god of divination, Ifa or Arunmala, is very important in Santeria, as the giver of hidden knowledge or wisdom to help individuals through the vicissitudes of their lives. For this reason, diviners, called Babalawo, are important persons in the whole spiritual system. Although Santeria developed in the Cabildos de Nacion which, as would be remembered, had the approval of the Spanish colonial authorities, its profoundly syncretic nature made it largely unacceptable to them. However, with the emergence of the Afro-Cubanismo movement in independent Cuba in the 1920s, Santeria's stature as a major African contribution to Afro-Cuban culture and Cuban civilization at last became firmly established. Santeria remains today a major spiritual influence among Cubans of African descent, blacks and persons of mixed blood, who constitute an estimated 32% of the population. Resistance to slavery was not as pronounced or as successful in Cuba as in Bahia but the Lukumis appear to have been in the forefront of almost all of the serious plots conceived by African slaves and freed Africans in the 19th century to revolt and abolish slavery and Spanish rule on the island one in 1812, another in 1835, and yet another in 1844. Leading Lukumis, slave and free, were among the persons arrested, tried and punished for these plots. One José Antonio Aponte, described as an influential freedman among the Lukumis and a member of the Ogboni Secret Society was the brain behind the 1812 plot. Tried and found guilty, he was executed with his accomplices, some of whom were leading members of his cabildo. After the 1835 plot was exposed, it was called the Lukumi Conspiracy, because its planners were prominent Lukumis. <laughs>
of the hundreds of conspirators arrested for the plot known as the Conspiracy of La Escalera in 1844, many were Lukumis. Here is in Bahia, the Yoruba love of freedom pushed many leading men and women of Yoruba descent to engage in plots to end slavery and Spanish rule even though, as is evident in the outcome of each plot, the government of the island was very vigilant. The Revolutionaries of Haiti The earliest Yoruba slaves brought to the large island of Hispaniola, also known as Saint Domingue, of which the western half, now known as Haiti, belonged to France, and the eastern half, now known as the Dominican Republic, belonged to Spain, probably came in the 16th century. However, it was not until the 17th century that Yoruba slave imports became important in St. Domingue. During the 1780s, demand for slaves by the plantations of St. Domingue reached great heights, resulting in the importation of very many slaves from the West African region. Most of such West African slaves were of Asia, Dahomey, and Yoruba origin. From 1790, great developments commenced on the island, leading to a massive and determined slave revolt that destroyed the French government and resulted in the emergence of an independent country with the name Haiti in 1804. The French planters fled the island, some of them with their slaves, and scattered to various destinations in the Americas, some ultimately coming to settle in Louisiana and South Carolina in the southern United States, as well as on the island of Jamaica. Further importations of slaves to Haiti ceased and this new country of slaves who had fought and freed themselves became the first country in the world to abolish slavery. The History of the Haitian Revolution, 17,911,804, is filled with stories of great courage and heroism by the rebelling slaves. In the face of some of Europe's best armies, sent by the Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte from France to suppress the rebellion, the slaves produced great leaders of men and won incredible victories in battles. Of the many leaders who emerged among them in the course of the revolution, two in particular, Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines, both of them ex-slaves, earned immortality for their bravery and high quality of command in battle as well as for their leadership qualities. Of the many battles won by the poorly equipped slave armies against vastly superior French forces, the one that was fought on November 16, 1803 remains perhaps the most memorable because it was one of the decisive final battles in the revolution. Randall Robinson describes that battle thus. Reports on the famous battle were that, under blistering fire from the French muskets and heavy gauge artillery pieces, Capoy's death, a black officer leading a column of ex-slave soldiers, shouted above the concussive blasts, En avant! En avant! Forward! Forward! As, mounted, he hurled himself and his men against the French line of fire, in an assault on the blockhouses of Breda and Champlain. Demonstrating the bravery that gave him his nom de guerre, death, he then rode at full gallop toward the French fort of Vertiers. When his horse was shot from under him, he rose and charged a foot toward the thick walls of the fort, pointing his sword in the direction of the French guns mounted behind the parapet, crying out anew to his men, En avant! En avant! His hat was then shot from his head. Again, he charged the French guns that exploded the ground around him. Men fell gut shot, blood all about. The sounds, sight, and smell of the awful deaths mixed with peals of thundering ordnance. En avant! En avant! Death screamed, a foot still never slowing. It was the battle that turned the war and handed victory to an army of ex-slaves who had soundly defeated three of the very best of Europe's armies. The revolt lasted twelve and a half years. Of the black slave and ex-slave population of about 465,000 in St. Domingue, about 150,000 died fighting for freedom and human dignity. Decades later, a Frenchman wrote in his memoirs. But what men these blacks are! How they fight, and how they die! One has to make war against them to know their reckless courage in braving danger. I have seen a solid column, torn by grape shot from four pieces of cannon, advance without making a retrograde step. The more they fell, the greater seemed to be the courage of the rest. How much the Yoruba slaves and ex slaves of St. Domingue contributed to this revolution it is not easy to assess definitively from the records. Positive ethnic identification of the revolutionaries is made difficult by many factors. On arrival on the slave ships, the slaves were immediately given French names by their masters. And then, they had to learn the French language quickly and so largely forgot their native tongues. If any children were born to them, these grew up speaking only French. Finally, Saint Domingue was notorious as the place where slaves received the most brutal, the most dehumanizing, treatment in the Americas a situation that, among other things, very rapidly wiped out distinctive ethnic identities. The Yoruba accounted for about 20% of Haiti's slave arrivals, and the Asia about 7%. As would be remembered, Asia culture and religion were very strongly influenced by Yoruba culture and religion, and there were therefore very profound cultural similarities between the two peoples.
In the context of St. Domingue, where the African population originated from more than a dozen ethnic sources, the combined influence of the Yoruba and the Asia produced the most significant African cultural and political impact. The hideous maltreatment of slaves by the plantation owners in St. Domingue regularly resulted in large numbers of deaths among the slaves. Such heavy losses in labor were regularly made up for by more and more importations of new slaves the largest volumes coming in the late 18th century. One important consequence of this was that, of the generation of St. Dominguez slaves which started the revolts in 1791, a very large proportion consisted of men recently brought from Africa, men whose memories of their African homes were still comparatively fresh. It was these men, many of whom had had some military training and experience in wars in their African homelands before ending up on slave ships, that constituted the core of the slave rebellions in St. Domingue. According to John Thornton, a majority of St. Dominguez slaves, especially those who fought steadily in the revolution, were born in Africa, in fact, a great many had served in African armies prior to their enslavement and arrival in Haiti, 60-70% to 70 of the adult slaves listed on, St. Dominguez, inventories in the late 1780s and 1790s were African-born. Where the African military background of the slaves counted most was in those areas, especially in the north, of St. Domingue, where slaves themselves led the revolution both politically and militarily, these areas, threw up the powerful armies of Toussaint Louverture and Dessalines and eventually carried the revolution. Now, the second half of the 18th century was the period when the Yoruba began to enter in rapidly increasing numbers into the transportation of slaves from Africa, as a result of the Oyo Wars of expansion, and then the growth of political instability in Oyo. And that too was the period of the largest volumes of slave imports from West Africa to St. Domingue, a major part of which imports consisted of Yoruba people. Therefore, Asia and Yoruba slaves constituted, by 1790, a very substantial part of St. Domingue's slaves born and raised in Africa and distinguished by the qualities and the skills that they had brought from their African homes the ones who, as Thornton puts it, carried the revolution. It seems certain therefore that the Yoruba contribution to the making of the Haitian Revolution was very great, and that many of the outstanding men in the revolution were of Yoruba, and Asia, descent. Here, as in Baia, we are almost certainly witnessing the Yoruba spirit of freedom, and the military capabilities of many of the Yoruba slaves, serving as a major contributor to the rebellion of enslaved African peoples against the horrific oppression characteristic of slavery in St. Domingue. In the course of the 19th century, independent Haiti evolved its own Creole culture, drawing upon many African heritages, of which the Yoruba and Asia cultures were prominent. A major feature of the Haitian Creole culture was the unique language. While a small minority of Haitians, mostly the dwellers in the few urban centers, continued to speak French, the overwhelming majority evolved Haiti's national Creole language, which was different from, less French and more African than, the Creole spoken in the other French-owned islands of the West Indies. Today, about 90% of Haitians speak Creole, and about 20% speak both Creole and French. It is in the area of religion, however, that Yoruba impact has been most measurable. Starting from the 18th century, the polyglot African community on the island, seeking to mitigate the vicious harshness of the slave environment, had started to evolve a new religious system, drawing on its various African heritages and, to some extent, on the Roman Catholic religion of the French planters. The new religion came to be known as Vodou. Vodou was derived from the Asia word for spirit, and the form and substance of the religion were adapted largely from the Yoruba and Asia systems of religion especially the Yoruba worship of Oruzes, belief in the efficacy of spiritually imbued charms, formularies and incantations and various types of African sacred music and dance. In independent Haiti during the 19th century, the influence of Vodou increased greatly, bringing its impact to bear on Haitian culture generally in art, music, dance, etc. A significant contribution of Yoruba Asia culture to one of the main Creole cultures of the New World. During the century also, the religious and other aspects of Haiti's culture, taken with them by slaves removed from Haiti at the time of the revolution were carried to many places in the West Indies and the Gulf of Mexico and other parts of the southern United States. Towards the end of the 19th century, the more educated Haitians, as well as the government of Haiti, began to show hostility towards Vodou on the grounds that, in their view, it prevented Haiti from growing as a modern civilized country. As it turned out, such attitudes did not diminish the influence of Vodou, because it was far too well entrenched among the broad masses of Haitians. In fact, during the first decades of the 20th century, a change occurred and most Haitian intellectuals came to accept Vodou as a significant feature of the national heritage of their country, and that has remained the predominant attitude of the country's educated elite. Trinidad
The island of Trinidad was a Spanish possession until the 1790s when the British took it from the Spaniards. By then the island was home to diverse groups of people French and Spanish settlers, with their Roman Catholic religious tradition, free persons of mostly African descent, Hindus imported as indentured servants from India. With the coming of the British in the 1790s, larger sugar plantations were introduced, and African slaves were imported to work them, thus adding African slaves of various ethnic origins to deepen the cultural complexity of the island. It was in these years of the close of the 17th and beginning of the 18th centuries that Yoruba slaves became a factor in Trinidad, representing a minority of the slightly over 20,000 slaves imported there. In 1807, about one decade after taking over Trinidad, Britain abolished the slave trade, thus cutting off further importation of slaves to the island. Then, with the abolition of slavery in all British possessions in 1833, all Africans in Trinidad became free. From the 1840s, considerable numbers of Africans, many of them Yoruba, who were liberated from slaving ships were brought to Trinidad as indentured servants. In short, Trinidad was different from most countries of the Americas in many respects, its ethnic composition was complex, slavery existed there for only a short time, and, even in that short time, the laws prohibited the practice of African religions. Yet, Yoruba culture did come to have a strong impact on the culture that developed there in the 19th century. In the years of slavery under the British, 1797-1833, the African slaves had to practice their religions in secret. In the circumstances of their hidden spiritual interactions, they evolved a syncretic religion incorporating elements from various African religious systems, from Catholicism, from Protestant Christianity, and even from Hinduism. For its gods, this religion chose the Orses of Yoruba religion and gave each Orisa two names a Yoruba name and a Catholic name. Thus, Obatala, the most senior of the Yoruba Orses, became known as Saint Benedict, Yamoja became Saint Anne, Ogun became Saint Michael, Sango became Saint John, to mention just a few. The religion was named Orisha religion and employed typically Yoruba shrines, rituals and sacrifices. Each shrine, like a church, and its spiritual leader, called Mongba, priest, Oriya, priestess, had to register with the authorities to be able to operate and perform its ebo, rituals and sacrifices. Its use of the names of Catholic saints mollified official opposition, and over time, Arisha religion developed relationships with some Protestant Christian sects, for example the spiritual Baptists, and even with Hinduism. The Yoruba among the indentured servants imported from the 1840s became particularly instrumental in boosting the influence of Yoruba culture and religion in Trinidad. The evolution of the Yoruba religious system as the main stem of Trinidad's Orisha religion was also accompanied by the spread of Yoruba influence upon Trinidad's culture in many other dimensions art, music, dance, costumes, etc. A great festival known as the Carnival evolved, putting all these influences on parade annually. The Trinidad Carnival, still celebrated every year by a broad spectrum of Trinidadians, features festive music, dancing, costumes and personal adornments of West African, mostly Yoruba ritual and ceremonial traditions, and attracts many tourists from all over the world. The Akis of Sierra Leone and those who returned From probably as early as the 17th century, some of the Africans forcibly taken away to slavery in the Americas found their way back to places on the West African coast, having bought their freedom, or become otherwise free, in the Americas. Some of such returnees became slave traders themselves on the West African coast or worked in the service of slave traders or of West African rulers engaged in the slave trade on the coast. From the descriptions of their facial marks, some of these might have been Yoruba, but the evidence on that is inconclusive. However, the number of returnees, better known as emigrants, increased substantially from the early 19th century, and since the Yoruba were among the largest ethnic groups being exported to slavery in the Americas at that time, the Yoruba also came to be a large group among the emigrants. Also, as would be remembered, from the 1820s, the British Navy seized illegal slave ships on the high seas, liberated the slaves being carried on them, and resettled the freed persons in Sierra Leone. Again, the Yoruba, known as Akis in Sierra Leone, because of the regular occurrence of Aku in their greetings, came to be a significant part of the population of the Sierra Leone settlement. The first Aku expedition from Sierra Leone to their Yoruba homeland took place in April 1839. After that, more followed many under the auspices of Christian missionary organizations, resulting in a gradual increase in the number of Akis returning home. As would also be remembered, they came to accumulate mostly in Lagos from the 1850s, and there they became known as the Saros, people from Sierra Leone. Even before the Akis from Sierra Leone, 
Many emigrants had started to return to Yorba land from the Americas during the century especially from Bahia, the rest of Brazil, and Cuba, and some from the islands of the West Indies. It was much more difficult for slaves to obtain their freedom in the United States, and, therefore, emigrants from there were very few. In Lagos, emigrants from any part of the Americas were known as the Amaros, people from the Americas. Much has been said in earlier chapters about the emigrants, their return to various parts of Yoruba land, and their importance in the late 19th century history of Yoruba land. Here, we will limit ourselves to a brief description of an important aspect of the life of the Aku society in Sierra Leone. The Akas were just one out of many African ethnic groups in Sierra Leone but most of the content of the Creole culture that developed there came from Yoruba cultural origins and language, folklore, music, food traditions, and way of life in general. Though the number of the Akas was one reason for such a strong cultural impact, number alone does not explain it. The most important factor was that the Akas, better than any other African group, had a strong tradition of keeping close together and evolving common institutions for their common good even though they were partly Christians, partly Muslims and partly worshippers of Yoruba traditional gods, and even though they originated from different Yoruba subgroups. The Akas actually evolved into a distinct community, with their own internal constitution and laws. By as early as the late 1820s, they had elected a Yoruba king for themselves, and established laws binding on all members of their group with serious group sanctions for the infringement of such laws. The colonial authorities were happy to have such an excellent organization among an African group, and gladly accorded the Aku king official recognition. In true Yoruba fashion, the Akas established the tradition of gathering in large numbers for important occasions, such as funerals and weddings, in the lives of members. The Akas also became well known for their spirit of enterprise. Akas joined together to start businesses, especially as traders, and the unity within their group usually gave their businesses a great advantage over other rivals. In the process, many of the leading Akas became quite rich. As a result of all this, the Akas became dominant in Sierra Leone economically, socially, and culturally. Summary. In general, then, Yoruba culture provided many of the answers to the quests of enslaved African peoples in the New World for identity, and for spiritual and cultural survival and expression in the hostile world of slavery. In particular, Yoruba cosmology and the well-ordered pantheon of gods in the Yoruba system of religion became, for Africans in many parts of the Americas, the readily available framework upon which to build spiritual experimentation and invention. As Wole Soinka has put it, the Orzes travel well. The Yoruba worship of the Orzes, and the Roman Catholic veneration of the saints, exhibited strong similarities, facilitating an interpenetration of the one with the other wherever both met in the New World. And everywhere, the spiritual genius of the African recognized and seized upon the similarity to accomplish various needs in some places to dissemble what they were really doing, in other places to include and mobilize among themselves, everywhere to fashion structures harmonious with their African spiritual intensity and appropriate to the realities of their current existence. Everywhere also, Yoruba and other African sacred art, emblems, music, drums, chants, songs and dance, proffered service to the new inventions, and brought in their train other art idioms that were secular. After the disappearance of institutional slavery, these new creations flowered into assertive Afro-Americanisms that today constitute icons in the civilizations of the New World. Some of the main centers of the experimentation and invention, Bahia, Cuba, Haiti and Trinidad, have been surveyed above. But there was hardly any part of the Americas without some touch of Yoruba cultural influence. In the southern and eastern states of the United States, for instance, as well as in many countries of Central America, South America and the West Indies, there are to be encountered, inside the broad strokes of African cultural influence, various specific manifestations of Yoruba religious and artistic influence in Orisa worship groups, art groups, festivals and ceremonies. One such emphatic manifestation named Oyo Tanji Village, on the coast of South Carolina, has in recent years attracted considerable attention. Oyo Tanji, meaning Oyo Resurrected, founded about 1959, is a bold creation of a traditional Yoruba town, complete with Anoba and chiefs, Ogboni society, priests and priestesses, shrines and rituals of the Orzes, sacrifices, seasonal and annual festivals, Yoruba music and music groups. In the years after Nigeria's independence, Chiefs of Suriname in South America took steps to establish contacts with the Palace of Ife, the place universally known as the ancestral source of the Yoruba people and Yoruba civilization. Some scholars have traced survivals of Yoruba influence on the art, music and speech patterns of African Americans of the southern states of the United States for instance, in certain types of houses common in African American culture in places like Alabama, South Carolina and other parts of the Deep South.
the contemporary popularity of Yoruba clothing styles, Agbada, Desiki, Buba, Iro, Hela, Fiela, among African Americans, the African American Juba dance, the influence of Sango sacred music and drums on African American music, the common occurrence of adapted Yoruba folk tales in African American folklore, and many others. Conclusion The Yoruba part of the African diaspora, then, represents, culturally, its most vital, most measurable, part. In a recent study of Yoruba civilization and the powerful and widespread influence of the Yoruba diaspora in the Americas, Augustine Aguayal states. According to Matori, since the 19th century the Yoruba nation has risen above all other Afro-Latin nations, it is preeminent in size, wealth, grandeur, and international prestige, it is studied, written about, and imitated far more than any other not only by believers but by anthropologists, art historians, novelists, and literary critics. Aguil adds that the Yoruba distinguished themselves in the diaspora by their unity and personal traits as a distinct ethnic and cultural group, and then he quotes Dr. de Vertoy who wrote in the 19th century that the Yorubas deserve particular notice, they are a fine race, their houses neat, comfortable and kept in perfect order within. In character, they are generally honest, and in disposition proud, and even haughty. Manifestations and expressions of Yoruba cultural heritage in the African diaspora, then, have received increasing attention since the late 20th century, just as studies of Yoruba civilization at home in West Africa have intensified. What all this seems to point to is an advancing transatlantic development of major significance in the history of black people.